Mr. McCoy here with part 14 up, closed for the season. As you recall, Arthur said, the hut is right there. He stabbed the map with his finger. I know we can find it. Violet stared at him. Find what, Arthur? A, a tumble-down shack? A little plastic man? The briefcase. Arthur was so excited he almost shouted. Mrs. Bunyan's turned, her finger to her mouth to shush us, but the man with the paper kept on reading as if he hadn't heard a thing. Don't you see? He lowered his voice. It has to be buried near the witch's hut. Do you really think it's there? Violet whispered. Yes, but not for much longer, Arthur said. Once the bulldozers destroy the place, the briefcase, the money, and the evidence will be gone forever. And we'll never know who killed your mother. Suppose Silas already has it, I said. He's got the note. He's got the map. Yes, but Violet's the only one who knows about the finding game. And she hasn't told Silas. He swung toward Violet. Right? Violet nodded. Uh, he might have the note, but he'll never figure it out. Arthur jumped to his feet, earning another sharp look from Mrs. Bunyan's. We've got to go to the magic forest right now headed toward the door, expecting all of us to rush after him. But Arthur, Violet said, I have to be at work in an hour. Can't you call in sick or something? If I lose any more time, they'll fire me, and I can't afford... When do you get off? Arthur interrupted. About 10.30 tonight, but... We'll meet you at Walmart, Arthur said, and you can drive us to the park. Violet hesitated. Uh, do we have to go there in the dark? Can't we wait until my day off or something? The bulldozers are coming to demolish the place tomorrow, Arthur said. It's tonight or never. What would you say to Arthur if he told you that you had to go to the magic forest at night? Would you say no way or would you follow him? Share your opinion with your fellow listener. The disgustingly wimpy part of me wanted to say, never, let it be never. But instead I said, you don't have to come with us, Violet. We can find it without you. I want to be there, she said in a low voice. I owe it to my mother. Can I come too, May asked. Violet hugged her. Absolutely not. Your bedtime is 7.30. When May started to protest, Violet stacked up a pile of picture books. Mrs. Jenkins can read these to you tonight. All of them? May asked. Oh, that's up to Mrs. Jenkins. Violet gave her another hug and kissed her forehead. Be a good girl tonight, and I'll treat you to some ice cream tomorrow. After Violet checked out her books, Arthur and I followed her and May out of the library and into the blazing heat of the August morning. As they drove away, I found myself wishing I could go to bed with a stack of books instead of traipsing around the magic forest looking for something we'd probably never find and maybe running into someone uh, we didn't want to meet in a dark place. I sure could use a nice cold soda, Arthur said. Do you have any money? I had enough to buy one can of root beer at the rundown gas station on Laurel Avenue. In the park across the street, uh, I drank half and passed the can to Arthur. Pigeons ambled around in circles, cooing to themselves in sad voices, and sparrows hopped here and there, picking crumbs out of the cracks on the pavement. With my head tipped back, I gazed across the dusty crabgrass at a granite pedestal topped by a life-size bronze statue of the town's founder, Robert Arthur Beale, 1841 to 1913. Shoulders splattered with bird droppings, he stood tall and gazed into the distance, almost likely, most likely envisioning a city of the future, a place of real significance, not a little backwater town like Bealesville. On a bench across from ours, two old men slumped side by side, just like Arthur and me. If we stayed in Bealesville long enough, we'd be sitting here when we were old, complaining about the heat and the cost of living, just like they were. Suddenly, a shadow slanted across my feet. I looked up to see Mr. De Silvio standing in front of me, his back to the sun. Well, hello, Logan he said, flashing his white teeth and a big Hollywood smile. Oh, um, hi, I stammer, going from relaxed to tense in about one second. That was how the man affected me. Desperate for something to say, I asked, have you met Arthur Jenkins? Mr. De Silvio gave Arthur the same fake smile. I've heard a lot about you from Anthony. 
He stuck out his hand and Arthur shook it. Arthur's face was red and I guessed he was thinking about the sorts of things Anthony must have told his father. Didn't I just see you in the library? Mr. De Silvio asked. Arthur and I looked at each other, not sure what to say. Mr. De Silvio must have been the man reading the paper, the man we'd barely noticed, the man sitting close enough to hear every word we'd said. Without waiting for us to reply, Mr. Silvio slipped his hands into his pockets, jingling his coins and keys. I always spend an hour or so in the morning, he went on, browsing through the Wall Street Journal. It's a pleasant way to start the day. I slunk a little lower on the bench and wished he would go away. He had a way of making me feel stupid, tongue-tied, itchy with heat and sweat and embarrassment. I couldn't help overhearing what you said about going to the Magic Forest tonight. Mr. Silvio shook his head. Despite the rumors, there's no money buried there. Mrs. Donaldson took the secret of its whereabouts to her grave. The sun was in my eyes, and I had to squint to see him clearly. Frankly, he went on, the park's a dangerous place, especially after dark. You could trip over a log, injure yourself, maybe break a leg. The buildings aren't safe either. The county condemned the whole place. Surely... You've noticed the big red signs posted everywhere, not to mention the no trespassing signs, he frowned. I'm tempted to call your parents and tell them what you're up to. As the owner, I'd feel responsible if anything happened to you boys. I found myself agreeing. The park was dangerous, spooky, deserted, overgrown with vines and weeds, a weird and lonely place full of grotesque statues and dilapidated buildings. The haunt of Jarmans and Phelpses and who knew who else. I didn't want to go there, not in the daytime, and certainly not in the nighttime. But Mr. De Silvio smiled at me approvingly. This is real life, kids, he said, not a TV thriller. I glanced at Arthur, expecting him to shoot off his big mouth. Eyes slitted against the sun, he stared up at Mr. De Silvio. To my surprise, he nodded his head. We were just kidding around. He said, I'd be scared to go out there after dark. Even in the daytime, it's way too creepy. Turning to me, he added, Let's just forget the whole thing, Logan. Stay home, watch videos at my house or something. I just rented a cool Japanese horror movie. That's a great idea, I said, limp with relief. I was saved. Instead of meeting some horrible end in the magic forest, I'd have a chance to grow up after all. Now you're making sense, Mr. De Silvio said. Glancing at his watch, he added, Nice to see you boys. Take care. As he walked away, I sighed happily. I didn't think you'd give in like that. I expected you to... Arthur stared at me, obviously puzzled. What makes you think I gave in? Well, you said we'd stay home, didn't you, and, and, and watch videos? Logan, did you take a stupid pill instead of a vitamin this morning? My heart dropped with a cold thud from my chest to my stomach. You mean we're still going? How else can we get the briefcase and clear Mrs. Donaldson's name? He looked at me closely. Are you wimping out on me? I shrugged. Uh, of course not. It's just that... It's just that you're scared. Arthur tossed the soda can into a trash basket and grabbed his bike. I only said that to keep him from calling your mother. I hope it worked. I pedaled after Arthur silently. I should have known what he was up to. We split up at the corner so my mother wouldn't see us together. Before he rode away, Arthur said, There's something about De Silvio. Something fake, sly, and... His voice trailed off. For once, he couldn't find the right word. But I knew exactly what he meant. So, Arthur was able to trick Mr. De Silvio by outright lying to him. Have you ever done that to an adult so that the adult doesn't suspect that you're up to something? Share your experiences with your fellow listener. After a long afternoon of reading and watching TV, I went to bed around 9, my usual time. I had to wait until dark, full dark, to risk sneaking out. I thought it was safe. I slid the screen up and climbed out my window and onto the front porch roof. Quietly, very Quietly, I crept to the edge and climbed down the pine tree beside the house. I felt like a kid in a book running away from home. I peeked through the living room window. Mom and Dad sat side by side on the couch watching an old movie. 
Suddenly, I felt this huge tide of sentimentality rush over me. There they were, totally unaware that their one and only child was about to risk his life on a dangerous mission. What if I never returned? Picturing their sorrow almost made me cry. Their son, their little boy, lost forever in a jungle of kudzu. Just as I was about to climb back up the tree, I heard a low whistle from Arthur's yard. It was too late to back out. I had to go. Quietly, I wheeled my bike out of the garage. With Bear trotting beside us, Arthur and I rode away into the night. Automobile headlights shone in our faces, almost blinding us. A man yelled at us for riding without lights. I guess it didn't help that we were both wearing dark clothes. It took longer than we thought to get to Walmart. When we finally arrived a little after 11, the huge neon sign was out and the parking lot was dark and spooky in the moonlight. That's Violet's old Ford, Arthur pedaled toward the only car in the lot. Sorry we're late, he called out. No one answered. We looked inside. The car was empty. Where is she? I asked. We went to the store and peered through the glass doors. A dim security light lit the interior. It was obvious everyone had left. Arthur frowned. Something's wrong. I feel it in my bones. I felt, too, a sort of cold dread rising from the soles of my feet to the top of my head. What should we do? Before Arthur could come up with an answer, a shadowy figure stepped out from behind a row of Walmart dumpsters. I didn't know who it was, nor was I about to hang around and find out. With adrenaline pumping through me, I started pedaling toward the highway and home. Arthur sped past me, but not bare. Tail wagging, the dog ran toward the dumpsters. Come back here, somebody yelled at us. It's Danny. Arthur braked to a screeching stop, and I swerved to miss hitting him. The two of us watched as Danny pedaled toward us on his old bike. What are you doing here? He hollered. What are you doing here? Arthur asked. Danny pulled up beside us. Looking for my mother, he said. Even though he kept his head down, I could see bruises on his face. One eye was swollen shut. What happened to you? Arthur asked. Danny shrugged. None of your business, weirdo. Your mother's not here, I said in an effort to change the subject. Danny looked at me scornfully. Duh. We were supposed to meet her after we got off work, I went on. My dad beat you to it, Danny muttered. She's with Silas, Arthur asked. Danny gripped his bike's handlebar so tightly his knuckles turned white. Looks like it. Why would she go anywhere with him? She hates Silas. He has a way of making you do what he says. Apparently unaware of what he was doing, Danny touched his eye. Arthur winced. But you and your dad don't say anything else about him. He doesn't deserve to be a dad or a husband or anything else. I wish they'd kept him in jail. I wish I never had to see him again in my whole life. With that, Danny bent over Bear and rubbed his face in the dog's fur. Good old Bear, he whispered. Best old dog in the world. Arthur and I glanced at each other. Neither of us knew what to say or what to do. And we were scared. Scared for Violet mainly, but also for Danny, who seemed to be crying, even though he couldn't be. Not really. But still. If you were there, what advice would you give to Logan and Arthur about what to do next? Share with your fellow listener. And now, literal seconds more of closed for the season. Finally, Arthur said, he won't hurt Violet. Will he? What do you think? The old Danny was back in control, sneer and all. Where did he take her? Arthur asked. The magic forest, idiot. Where else? We'll find out what happens next as closed for the season continues.